But you can scoff and call me an idiot or a deluded moron or a retard all you like. Nah, too easy. You know, folks, recently I have been making videos in which I explain the geologic events of the Noachian flood, that is the flood of Noah. And I explain how God split the earth open at the mid-oceanic ridges and water ejected out of the earth at supersonic speeds because of the tremendous, tremendous pressure of 197 square million square miles of the earth's oceanic and continental surface area. That is 10 miles, up to 10 miles of the earth's crust 197 potential miles, square miles of it, bearing down upon the water inside the earth, created such pressure that when God split the earth open, water ejected at supersonic speed, and dirty, eye, uh, dirty water rushed out of the earth, out of the earth's atmosphere, frozen space to become comets, the comets that come past the earth once in a while, which science proves cannot be 10,000 years old because of the rate at which they did, they burn up as they pass the sun, by the way. I've never figured out where this average life expectancy for comets come from. I first heard it from Dr. Mark Surtees, aka Dr. False Dichotomy, whose videos were also posted by Nephilim Free, so that's probably where he got it from. Where do comets come from? Comets are a window to the formation of the outer planets. They are exactly what we would expect to have formed in the outer regions of our solar system. Small masses of ices and dust guided into specific regions by the solar winds and the gravity of the outer planets. The closer of these regions is called the Kuiper Belt. Although not the biggest or the closest, the first of these bodies to be discovered is the former planet Pluto. The second region of icy debris is called the Oort Cloud. Although the Oort Cloud is much further away than the Kuiper Belt, extending outward about two light years, its members most likely formed closer, around the orbit of Jupiter, where they were flung out into eccentric orbits out of the plane of our solar system. While the vast majority of these Kuiper and Oort cloud objects are completely unchanged since their formation 4.5 billion years ago, occasionally a few are knocked out of their orbits due to the gravity of the outer planets or a neighboring star as we orbit the galaxy. Some of these comets are destroyed on a close approach to the Sun, Others are taken on a trajectory that sends them out into interstellar space after the first pass through the inner solar system. A rarity are the few re that remain in highly elliptical orbits for their lifetime. I can remember seeing Comet hale -Bopp in elementary school. It became visible in 1997. However, it will not be seen again until approximately 4385. Right now, it is still on its return trip to its aphelion in the inner portion of the Oort cloud. It's been said that there is no proof that the Oort cloud even exists because it's too far and too faint to be seen. A astronomer by the name of Oort got around the problem by saying, well, actually, we've, he suggested the Oort cloud is a source of the long period comets. You have a diagram of what he th thinks the Oort cloud looks like. And out to about one light year, you have what's called the Oort cloud. It's basically a cloud of comet sized objects in a spherical shell around the sun. And every now and then, a passing star just perturbs the gravitational field slightly and one of these comets drops in towards the sun so they could come from any direction. You need a constant source of these comets because they only last for a few thousand years maximum. But it's never actually been observed. It's a very interesting phenomenon and some astronomers have made a comment in, in the scientific literature that here we have an object that's never been observed or a phenomenon that's never been observed which is cited in the literature over and over again to explain the origin of comets. So is that scientific? Well not very. Fortunately Visual confirmation is not necessary to prove something's existence. The Oort cloud was proven to exist statistically by measuring the trajectory of passing comets. It is not even that hard to do. It's been done successfully using Newton's law of gravity since 1758. And these comets, which were water inside the Earth, pelted the moon. And that's why we have a microscopic thin layer of water across the large per largest percentage of the moon's surface facing the earth and craters on the moon with ice chunks in them what the earthward face of the moon is covered with ice what part of water won't freeze this close to the sun don't you understand why do you think comets have tails they are sublimating from the solar flux do you remember this 
Comets are made mostly of hydrogen compounds, i.e. methane, ammonia, water, etc. These compounds cannot solidify in the vicinity of the terrestrial planets. Therefore, they must have formed near the gas giants. Or perhaps something more recent. You see, the water that NASA found on the moon was in the only place where you can get water on the moon. In the frigid, permanently shadowed craters of the lunar poles. Everywhere else on the moon, water would be simply boiled off into space due to the solar flux and the low gravity of the moon. But of course, you can go further out, say to Jupiter, where there is only one twenty-fifth of the solar flux. And there you can happily get comparable-sized moons that are 50% by mass water. Second, if the moon was covered in a thin layer of frost, it would be unbearably bright. Lunar regolith only reflects about 10% of the light that impacts it. Frost reflects almost all of it. Ever heard of snow blindness? You don't get that on the moon! Third... Nine or eight. Plus, correction, zero, zero, five, seven, two. Perigee, plus, zero, 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 eight, five. Zero, zero, seven, six, four. Hey, just for fun, did you know that the Chinese uh, language is the oldest continuously written language in the world and developed just about the time of the Tower of Babel? Go figure. And guess what? The Chinese characters, the text characters for Chinese, contain the vast majority of the major events of the book of Genesis, written right into their pictographic text characters, because the Chinese worshipped the same God as we did in the beginning. They called him Shang Di which is very similar if to the backwards written El Shaddai from the Old Testament. Isn't that funny? And guess what? The pictographic character for the English, Chinese word ship, you know what it's comprised of? Other pictographic characters, which, you know what those mean? Eight persons or mouth and boat. Eight people on a boat. Isn't that some? This is the character to which Neff is referring. Now, as he states in the vid, the component to the left is indeed a ship. This is the radical of the character which determines the category of its meaning and significance. The portion on the right, however, is the phonetic portion of the character and has nothing to do with its meaning. The vast majority of characters found in modern Chinese consist of a radical which suggests meaning and a phonetic component which suggests pronunciation. Furthermore, even though the component on the right does indeed look like a combination of eight and mouth, it wasn't originally. This is in fact a variant of a character that consists of table and mouth as the phonetic component. The written Chinese language has undergone a great deal of evolution of its own. Much like biological evolution, this process consisted of the emergence of different variants, coupled by the efforts of governments throughout history to standardize and or simplify the characters. Due to the manner in which the Chinese brush is both held and moved, you end up with horizontal strokes that are often much thinner than their vertical counterparts. This gave rise to variants in which the horizontal lines either atrophied or were phased out altogether. So not only is the boat, table, and mouth character older than the boat, eight, mouth variant, but they are actually considered and treated as the same character. There are instances where you can even copy the character as it appears as one variant, only to have it paste as the other variant. You could also drop this character into word processing program and watch it change as you shift through various fonts. But the little evos out there on YouTube, you know what they do? You're an idiot, Neff. You're a moron. You can't do science. You can't do physics. You're a moron. Actually, yeah. You can't do math. You can't do physics. You have proven that repeatedly since you started making videos. But it's worse than your fumbling of facts and your misquoting or misunderstanding of scientific sources. If you were merely just ignorant, this series would be named Typical Creationist Idiot. Through your actions on YouTube, you have demonstrated your dishonesty. You know that you are not nearly as educated as you say you are. You never mentioned viscosity or superfluids until I mentioned it to you. You never mentioned Bernoulli's theorem until Alkmaroid explained it to you. And then you have the nerve to pejoratively throw them at us. I want to show you how anti-science, non-scientific, and utterly stupid the average evolutionist 
God denialist atheist on YouTube really is. How they fail at every attempt to try to the water to eject from the earth at great speed. And look at what this idiot Osmoroid posts. He says, nope, JR is correct. Velocity depends only on pressure. <laughs> only on pressure, this idiot says. I mean, seriously, did this kid drop out of school at fourth, in the fourth grade or something? I mean, really, think about it. Velo velocity is not dependent only on how much pressure is applied to a liquid. Temperature and viscosity also play an important role. Molasses does not flow as quickly as water with the same amount of pressure on it. And hot molasses flows faster than cold molasses. But this dork Osmoroid can't get it through his head how science works. So he. You really want to prove that you understand physics? This is my physics textbook. It contains all the information required for the first two years of most scientific undergraduate studies. Most of the exercises in this book can be solved by my classmates or myself in minutes. You would be lucky to solve one of them in your lifetime. I'll prove it. Try this exercise. It's regarding a topic you have frequently discussed. What about this one? It's simpler. And again, you have blathered on about this very topic as if you are an expert. Too hard? Take a look at this instead. This is my calculus textbook. It contains all the basic skills required before I could even study the aforementioned physics. Can you integrate this? Can you differentiate this? What's this limit? How about that one? The fact is, no matter how much internet reading you've done... Two years of my life reading, studying everything I could find on the internet. If you can't do the math, then you can't do the physics. I have always been interested in studying science, but I had no idea how little I really understood until I took these six courses. And I know that despite all I've learned, I have barely gotten my feet wet in the academic world. And that's not even the root of the problem. You have absolutely no idea what you're up against. Your paranoid conspiracy theory that we blindly follow a minority of sanctimonious god denialists bent on twisting facts and hiding evidence that supposedly supports your dusty old book? You could not be more wrong. And in case you didn't know, that's what Nephilim Free was attempting to parody in his infamous paper-eating clip. I swallow. Evolution. I believe. I have faith in evolution. These humble textbooks that thousands of students use every semester, they exist due to the hard work and dedication of dozens of individuals over several centuries. While each of the concepts in my books took hours to days to completely get a handle on, the insight and experimentation that it must have taken to discover these is something that I can hardly comprehend. And now we come to the real reason your debate challenges have gone unanswered. Many people have made the comparison that a scientist debating you is like a heavyweight champion beating up a five-year-old. I disagree. Debating you is more like a modern army fighting one guy with a dart gun. You see, Neff, when you challenge Don Exodus 2 or Thunderfoot for a debate, you won't just be debating them. You will be debating every person who ever contributed to the knowledge that they have gained during their education. This is just a tiny fraction of the people who stand behind them. And what do you have? Your old book of fables, a few charlatans, and your own warped imagination. And no, we do not just swallow what we're told or take it on faith. If you have ever been in any classes like mine, you would know that they are much more involved than memorizing facts. Experiments are conducted, equations are derived, and concepts are proven. And all the faith in the world can't top that. One more thing before this video is concluded. I took this screenshot from one of Concordance's videos. Take a look. That's right. Nephilim Free thinks that autism is a belief system. Just when you think he can't get any more stupid, he keeps talking.